My name is Jane. I am currently fulfilling my role as a professional while simultaneously raising my beloved only son, Paul. I have a long history of work experience and never intended to give up my career, even after getting married. Especially in my small but independent company, I have never faced a situation where my salary was reduced even after returning to work post-childbirth. During the leave I took for my son's childcare, I entrusted the management of the company to someone I trust, so I never worried about the management or progress of the business. However, the only issue that troubles me amidst my peaceful days is entirely different. It involves the presence of my mother-in-law. My husband Danny, our son Paul and I lived together in a comfortable house. But soon after my father-in-law passed away, my mother-in-law suddenly imposed herself into our home. I assumed she would return to her own home after a short stay, but she chose to continue living with us without showing any intention to leave. When I gently inquired, how long do you plan to stay with us? Her reaction was unexpected. She became emotional and exclaimed, how could a heartless daughter in lie tempt to drive out an old woman like me? After losing my beloved husband, being forced to live alone in my hometown is incredibly cruel. Danny, who had overheard part of the conversation, rushed to her side and comforted her, Mom, it's okay. I would never kick you out, so please don't cry. After she calmed down, Danny took her to a different room. Once we were alone, he looked at me sharply and accused, How can you say such horrible things to my mother? Do you not have a heart? Misunderstandings might have arisen because Danny did not hear the whole conversation, but I had not forbidden my mother-in-law from living with us. As I explained, I was just asking how long you plan to stay, not that I wanted her to leave, he retorted, asking about the stay sounds like you want her to leave early. Can't you understand other people's feelings? I regret using inappropriate words, but I never intended to drive her out. However, Danny, taking my mother-in-law's excessive reaction at face value, seemed to have decided I was in the wrong. I had no choice but to leave the situation as it was, making my daily life small troubles deepen due to complex family relationships and the nuances of emotions involved. As a business owner, mother, and wife, I juggle these roles daily, trying to balance each. I wonder how long my mother-in-law plans to stay in our home. Asking her directly would likely result in her accusingly crying and appealing to Danny, so I hesitate to ask directly. Yet, when I contemplated how long she might stay, she unexpectedly announced, I've sold my old house, so I'm moving all my belongings here in front of the moving company truck parked outside our home, leaving me speechless. It was my day off, and I had planned to take Paul to the amusement park. However, Danny approached my mother-in-law, suggesting, then, today will be for sorting things out. This visit to the amusement park was a promise made long ago, eagerly anticipated by Paul, who looked disappointed when he asked, Mom, what about the amusement park? Don't worry, Paul. As promised, we're going to the amusement park, I reassured him. Danny frowned and showed his dissatisfaction, asking, Are you planning to leave the luggage unattended just for going to the amusement park? I confidently argued, Why should we change our plan for a family visit to the amusement park, breaking a promise to our child for sorting luggage? I find such behavior unacceptable. The visit to the amusement park had been planned weeks in advance, with all preparations made for that day. Yet, I was not informed about the move, and when told today was the day for unpacking, I prioritized the plans already set. Nevertheless, my mother-in-law began to cry exaggeratedly, claiming, Jane finds living with me uncomfortable. That's why she prioritizes her child over me. Hearing this, the movers, either feeling the situation was deadlocked or tired of my mother-in-law's exaggerated performance, quietly pointed out, Unpacking can wait. Shouldn't promises to children take priority? And did you properly inform your wife about the move? Upon hearing the calm comment, my mother-in-law blushed and felt ashamed. Danny, witnessing this development, did not defend her but merely looked at me intently. 
It appeared that Danny prioritized helping his mother with the move over our planned enjoyable family visit to the amusement park. In light of this situation, I decided to take my son, Paul, to the amusement park as previously planned. Unfortunately, this choice created a noticeable distance between my husband and me. One day, my mother-in-law said to me, Jane, would you mind staying at home on your next day off? I asked her why. The truth is, I want to spend time with Paul. But since you always monopolize him, I hardly get the chance to play with him, she complained. This request came about a week after she had moved into our house without permission. She probably overheard my plans to take Paul to the shopping mall on my next day off. Suddenly, she forbade me from visiting the shopping mall, asserting, Danny, Paul, and I will go to the shopping mall, so you should stay at home. Normally, there would be an option for the whole family to go out together, but excluding me seemed very selfish. Having witnessed her previous fake crying and such behavior, I could no longer trust her words. Therefore, considering it unthinkable to leave my child with someone I couldn't trust, I suggested, why don't we all go out together? Although she looked displeased, she could not directly accuse me of being mean and reluctantly agreed. At the shopping mall, I began selecting clothes for Paul as originally planned, choosing slightly larger sizes considering children's rapid growth. My mother-in-law interrupted, why can't you choose the right size? This is the perfect size for Paul, bringing a size that fits him right now. Even when I explained, children grow fast, she argued, when he grows, we can just buy new clothes. There's no need to save so much. I was dumbfounded by her short-sightedness. Selecting perfectly fitting clothes and buying new ones every time they become small is clearly a waste of money. We didn't have the financial leeway to spend money in such a way at our house. When I hesitated to purchase, Danny appeared and pointed out, I support the family financially. If you try to save, it makes me look stingy to others. Eventually, Danny covered the shopping expenses for my mother-in-law. Paul wore his new clothes comfortably for a while but soon complained, these clothes are too tight now, and stopped wearing the clothes chosen by my mother-in-law. She seemed to have mixed feelings about this change. Out of necessity, I passed the outgrown clothes to a colleague's mother I had befriended at the daycare. This act was well received, making me feel happy. However, the existence of the daycare seemed indesirable to my mother-in-law. Why do you need to leave Paul with others when I'm here? Moreover, continuing to work with a child is not good for their education, she criticized. I couldn't agree with this point, responding, The reality is, we can't make ends meet without my job, but she just snorted. How much do you even earn? I'm confident Danny's earnings surpass that. We can manage without your help. Besides, you're probably a burden at work anyway. It seemed possible that Danny hadn't told his mother about my role as a business owner. His occasional bragging nature might have led him to hide such an important fact, perhaps to avoid letting his mother know that his wife earns more than he does. Faced with such a situation, I was deeply disappointed. Actually, I earn more than Danny, I explained calmly yet firmly. My mother-in-law's response turned to anger. How can you say such a thing? Looking down on your own husband and boldly declaring you earn more. Do you not respect your husband? You neglect your duties at home and boast about outturning him. Don't you have any respect for him? Danny can manage perfectly fine without you. She exclaimed furiously. As her anger reached its peak and her voice echoed throughout the room, Danny appeared asking, what's going on here? As if she had found reinforcements, my mother-in-law spoke with renewed vigor. Hey, Danny. Actually, we wouldn't be troubled without Jane, right? It should just be you, me, and Paul living happily together. Don't you think our life is being constrained because Jane is here? She said, what? Um, yeah, Danny hesitantly, but eventually, showed his agreement. Then, the best thing to do is to divorce. She continued and, shockingly, she immediately took out a divorce form. It seemed she had wanted our divorce for some time. 
I no longer had any expectations for a father who prioritizes his mother over his child. However, I had no intention of giving up custody of my child. It seems my presence is entirely unwelcome. If you wish for a family of three, then I shall leave this house, I responded calmly, and without hesitation, I signed the divorce form she proposed. Despite forcing me to cancel our amusement park plans and insisting on helping with the packing, as soon as I started preparing to move out, she took Danny on a trip. Though she invited Paul to a trip, he had seen her unpleasant behavior towards me and still resented her for nearly causing us to miss our amusement park trip. He chose to stay with me, declining her invitation. Thus, Danny and she ended up going on a trip alone. I took this opportunity to move mine and Paul's belongings to a new home. I also left a letter stating that the responsibility for future rent payments, custody, and property division would be Danny's, as outlined through a lawyer. Returning from a week-long trip, Danny and his mother, unaware of the situation, contacted me surprisingly quickly. Jane, why did you take Paul with you? Mom is worried. I'm supposed to have custody, aren't I? He accused. It became clear at that moment that Danny had not yet read the letter I left. Please read the letter on the living room table, I said. Danny replied, oh, mom said she would look at it first. I've outlined that you'll be taking on $4,000 rent responsibility, that I will not transfer Paul's custody, and that we'll discuss property division through a lawyer, I explained. Rent is $4,000, he exclaimed in surprise. He knew the housing was rented and that I had been making the payments, but he was unaware of the specific amount. I couldn't believe he was unaware of the rent amount while managing our finances. Indeed, this house was a rental, costing a hefty $4,000 monthly, and initially, I was against living here. However, Danny was adamant about living in this house, and eventually, we rented it according to his wishes. As a president, you should have no problem with this level of rent, right? He said, leaving the burden to me. As a result, I ended up paying $4,000 rent monthly, with Danny covering other living expenses. However, he was careless with money and prone to spending impulsively. There was an instance at the shopping mall where, after shopping without calculating, my mother-in-law ended up short at the register and reluctantly called me for help. It seems this mother and son lack financial management skills, often spending on personal luxuries before covering living expenses. I had to cover the shortfall each time. I had savings for Paul's future and was putting my entire salary into our household, leaving me with very little personal spending money. Recently, I also had to cover the expenses and pocket money for his mother, putting us in a financially tight situation. But with the divorce finalized, I am relieved from the burden of $4,000 monthly rent. Registering the house under his name, which was done for his vanity, turned out to be fortunate. This allows me to withdraw from the financial carelessness of the two, bringing significant mental relief. There's no way I can pay that amount. You've always been paying, continue doing so, he pleaded. Why should I pay the rent for a house I no longer live in? I was driven out by your mother. The divorce is finalized and there's no longer any connection between me and that house. Therefore, I have no obligation to pay the rent, I counted. So, so, please, help me, Denny begged pathetically, but then it seemed his mother grabbed his phone, and her voice came through. We can pay the rent without you. Even the amount you claim to have been paying is manageable for Danny, she asserted. With a take-home pay of only $2,000, how do you plan to pay the monthly rent of $4,000? Are you going to use magic? That would be remarkable, I said sarcastically. What? Came the reply. It seemed that my mother-in-law genuinely misunderstood Danny to be financially well off, probably because she saw him paying during their shopping trips, leading her to believe he was wealthy. I was just dumbfounded by this fact. I thought it was impossible for Danny, with his take-home pay of $2,000 and almost no savings, to afford the rent. 
Moreover, expecting them to raise a child healthily in their financially unstable situation would be difficult. Even without Paul's consent, custody would naturally fall to me, as Danny and my mother-in-law couldn't provide a suitable environment for raising a child. So, so, what should we do then? They were bewildered. If you can't pay the rent, you have no choice but to change your living situation. You'll have to notify the real estate agent to cancel your lease. The longer you delay, the more you low in rent, I urged them to act swiftly. My words were met with, shut up. I know that much. From my mother-in-law, who clearly had no room for fake tears in this situation. After hanging up, I completed the move to a new apartment with Paul. This apartment is close to my workplace and conveniently located near shops and medical facilities. About a month after the divorce, my mother-in-law and Denny showed up at my company. They began loudly demanding to see me at the entrance, as reported by the receptionist. I was out having lunch with Paul at the time but hurried back with him upon hearing they were causing a commotion. Fortunately, there's a daycare within the company, so I could bring Paul inside. Seeing my mother-in-law and Danny waiting at the reception was a surprise. I was puzzled by their visit since the lawyer had reported they hadn't responded to our discussions. Jane, can't you just come back home? We understand you were making the payments. Please stop being stubborn. My mother-in-law pleaded with tears, thinking her act would work on someone other than her son. She clearly intended to paint me as the villain. Witnessing her behavior, Danny joined in, what do you mean by getting a lawyer involved? This is a family matter. Surely, Paul would prefer his parents to be together. However, a father who chooses his mother over his son would only sadden the child. I sighed and replied, now that we're divorced and essentially strangers, please communicate through my legal representative for anything. Danny, realizing he wouldn't get through to me directly, turned to Paul with my mother-in-law, Hey, Paul, you want to be with your dad and grandma, right? Aren't you lonely when your mom is always busy with work? Frightened by their words, Paul hid behind me and cried out loudly, I hate you both because you're mean. His crying had a more significant impact on the people around than my mother-in-law's fake tears. Soon after, other employees came and escorted Danny and my mother-in-law outside, to my relief. Later, after notifying them through the lawyer that any further company visits or following us would be reported to the police, they quieted down. Subsequently, Danny and my mother-in-law abandoned their $4,000 a month housing for a dilapidated apartment. Danny's fate took a darker turn as he had previously bragged about living in a luxurious home beyond our means at his workplace. Fearing the revelation of their move to a rundown apartment, he quit his job without consulting his mother, leading to her fury upon discovering his sudden job resignation. As a result, they started working to earn an income, frequently blaming each other for abandoning me and Paul, resulting in constant arguments. Despite this, they are trying to make ends meet, sending child support monthly while working hard. Meanwhile, my business is thriving, and despite the absence of his father, Paul is growing up to be a well-rounded boy. Even without an unfit father, I am determined to raise him well. Your presence is no longer needed. Really? How long do you plan to stay here? Leave this house quickly. You incompetent leech living off the money Steve left behind. Disappear. You're in the way. What? Can I really leave? Won't you regret this later? Of course. Don't make me repeat myself. I am Emma, 34 years old, working in the medical field. I met my husband, Steve, a 37-year-old surgeon, two years ago at the hospital we both worked at, and we got married. Upon marrying, I quit my job to focus on being a homemaker, as per my husband's wish. Currently, I am five months pregnant and suffering from severe morning sickness. My husband is a respected surgeon, admired by his peers for his skill. He is kind, gentle and loved by patients and hospital staff alike. Our marriage is strong, and he is incredibly supportive, actively helping with household chores without a single complaint. Despite his demanding job, his dedication to our family is something I am deeply grateful for. The only concern I have is related to my in-laws. Hey, Emma, I have a request. I'd like to live with my parents and my sister Abby. 
My dad needs care and I want to support them as much as possible. It will also reduce the burden on my mom. Plus, with a baby on the way, having extra hands will be helpful for you, and it might make it easier for you to return to work. What do you think? That sounds good to me. I'm okay with it. Steve's family is kind, and if I can help take care of your father, it will lighten the load on your mom and Abby. Thank you, Emma. That means a lot to me. My mother-in-law has always been kind to me, and my sister-in-law Abby left a good impression during our family's meeting and our wedding, so I was confident we could build a good relationship. Thus, upon getting married, I started living with my in-laws and sister-in-law Abby. However, this shared living situation would soon change my life. One day, not long after we started living together, I was lying in bed in my room still suffering from severe morning sickness, when I was called to the living room by my mother-in-law. My husband had left for work early in the morning and my father-in-law was resting in another room, so it was just me, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law Abby in the living room. My mother-in-law, usually calm, looked stern. Feeling tense, she suddenly spoke up. Emma, you're hardly managing the household chores and yet you're lazing around in bed? Since you're not paying rent, I want you to contribute $5,000 to the household every month. This was the start of an incomprehensible discussion. I'm sorry, I've been suffering from continuous morning sickness and have hardly been able to get out of bed. I feel terrible for relying so much on you and Abby for household chores, but I thought I was contributing enough each month. Well, enough. You think a mere $2,000 is enough. We're letting you live here because we thought you'd help with the housework and take care of our father. You're not helping at all. Why did my son even choose someone like you as his wife? There's no need to say something so harsh. When I was young, regardless of morning sickness or anything else, I dedicated myself to my new family. You need to put in more effort. And I'm tired of taking care of that man. That's why I suggested to Steve that we all live together. Steve is a doctor, so $5,000 a month shouldn't be a big deal, right? Well then, I'm counting on you. We're going out for a bit, so take care of the housework and take care of our father. Useless sister-in-law. Saying this, the two of them left. I was shocked by their sudden change of attitude as I thought we were getting along well. Despite not feeling well, I couldn't just sit around. So, I managed to suppress my discomfort from the morning sickness and started cleaning, doing laundry and preparing meals for my father-in-law. My father-in-law, though unable to move his lower body, did not show signs of dementia and communicated well. He seemed to feel guilty about me taking care of everything alone, especially considering my pregnancy. I'm truly sorry that you have to take on everything, Emma. Considering the baby and your own health, I wish it wasn't so burdensome for you. It's okay. Steve is very supportive, so I don't feel burdened at all. Besides, I enjoy the time I spend talking with you. I'm really grateful, my father-in-law said, tears welling up in his eyes, expressing his gratitude. That evening, when my husband returned home, I told him about the demand from my mother-in-law and Abby for a monthly contribution of $5,000. However, I didn't mention their change in attitude, not wanting to worry him. $5,000, huh? Understood. Well, we are living here and my parents are living on their pension. Abby also has a regular work and doesn't have a stable income. My husband agreed to the monthly payment of $5,000 without hesitation, understanding the situation. Since my husband was okay with it, I reluctantly agreed as well. Then, one day, I received a call that my husband had collapsed at the hospital while at work. Worried sick, I managed to calm my panic enough to find out which hospital he was taken to, and immediately called a taxi to rush there. Steve was already unconscious during the transport and tears threatened to spill in the taxi. My mind was filled with pessimistic thoughts, hoping against hope that he would be okay. But, despite my wishes, Steve passed away shortly after we arrived at the hospital from an acute heart attack. He had left the house that morning with his usual kind smile, making it hard to accept the reality. Steve was only 37 years old. He had his whole life ahead of him, passionate about his work and excited to become a father soon. The thought of not being able to introduce our child to his or her father left me sobbing beside his body. Time passed, and my mother-in-law and Abby arrived at the hospital. My father-in-law had to stay home so a helper was arranged urgently. Oh, I can't believe this. My dear Steve, why a heart attack? Really? This is all Emma's fault. Emma, if you had noticed Steve's health issues sooner, this tragedy wouldn't have happened. You're a disaster. Mom is right. The reason my brother died is because you came into our house. I'll never forgive you for taking him away. 
I'm truly sorry. Having just lost my husband, my heart was too broken to argue with them. I could only apologize. Maybe it was all my fault. If only I had noticed something was wrong with Steve sooner, he might still be alive. I was tormented by this thought for a while. Eventually, the funeral was held. Many of Steve's friends and colleagues came to say their goodbyes. I felt a profound loss and sorrow from the respect people had for my husband. But I knew I couldn't grieve forever. I have to become stronger for the sake of our child that's about to be born. I resolved. However, my resolve was quickly shattered by my in-law's words. Look, Emma. Just because Steve has passed away doesn't mean you're thinking of going back to your parents' house, right? Uh, well. I'm expecting soon, and the morning sickness hasn't ended, so I might return to my parents' house a bit earlier. What? If you go back to your parents, what will happen to the daily routine here? Who will take care of dad? You think you can just leave irresponsibly just because my brother died? As for taking care of dad, hiring a helper could lessen the burden. Hiring a helper? What are you thinking? As long as you're here, there's no need for outside help. That's a waste of money. Angered by their words, I responded, May I remind you, my mother-in-law is almost always home and Abby only works three days a week on a non-regular basis. Aren't you two perfectly capable of handling the household and taking care of dad? My mother-in-law retorted, I'm busy with community activities and hobbies. I don't have time to do housework, let alone care for him. She spends her time at home just watching TV and lounging around, using any excuse to shift all responsibility onto me. On my days off from my part-time job, I'm busy looking for a marriage partner. I can't spare any effort or money on beauty treatments to find a handsome, high-earning man. Oh, I just don't have enough time. Unlike you, who can stay home all day? Abby, significantly overweight and far from the beauty ideal she claimed, bafflingly exuded confidence from nowhere. And Emma, it's not an exaggeration to say Steve's death is your fault. So, you'll continue to take care of the household and dad and will also need the same $5,000 a month for living expenses. We've heard about the savings Steve left behind, so paying shouldn't be an issue, right? But, I don't have an income right now, and with the baby coming, expenses will increase. I wanted to save Steve's money for our child's future. Oh, but is that child really Steve's? Could it be someone else's? That's really funny. Really? Emma, you're so vulgar. Then it's even more unthinkable to use Steve's money for a child that might not be his. Please wait. This child is indeed Steve's. It's terrible to say such things. But realizing arguing was futile, I gave up on going back to my parents and resigned myself to contributing $5,000 a month for living expenses, continuing the household chores and caring for my father-in-law. It seems excessive for a family of four to need that much, especially with pension income. Though I have some savings, I didn't want to dip into the inheritance Steve left, preferring to save it for our child's future. Moreover, returning to my parents would leave my father-in-law without proper care. If help or support isn't an option, going back isn't either. Ah, uh, my belly is getting heavier and it's tough, but it seems like I have no choice but to handle the household chores and caregiving on my own. I managed the household and caregiving tasks as best as I could, using delivery services for grocery shopping to keep it unnoticed by my mother-in-law and Abby. One day, while preparing a meal for my father-in-law, an incident occurred. Hey, Emma, can I talk to you for a moment? There's something I need to tell you. Yes, what is it? At that moment, my mother-in-law and Abby were out, and it was just my father-in-law and me at home. I wanted to tell you something while they're not around. Please listen to this. He handed me a voice recorder and the moment I pressed play, I was shocked. Is this? My mother-in-law and Abby's voices? What are they saying? I can't believe this. I heard a conversation between my mother-in-law and Abby. I felt a growing outrage towards them and it felt like something inside me broke. Unforgivable, absolutely not. From there, my father-in-law and I devised a plan, and I was determined to carry it out. We waited for the night to come. When my mother-in-law and Abby returned home happily, I made them an offer. Mother, Abby, as a token of my gratitude, how about a trip just for the two of you? Of course, my father-in-law and I will stay here. A trip. Wonderful. I want it to be abroad. Emma, that's a great idea. 
How about inviting two friends and all of us going to Europe? Of course, it's fine to invite your friends. Why don't you take a little break for about two weeks? Emma, you do come up with good suggestions sometimes. The thought of getting away from this depressing daughter-in-law and that old man, what an expected happiness. As a result, they planned a two-week trip to Europe, including their friends, one month later, without suspecting our plan. Then, the day of their trip arrived. After seeing off the two who left in high spirits, I immediately started preparing to leave this home. Being in the later stages of pregnancy and unable to carry heavy items, I called my mother to help me. After telling my parents everything, they expressed their anger towards my mother-in-law and Abby but warmly welcomed me to come back home. Then, after completing the moving preparations, I expressed my gratitude to my father-in-law. Though it was for a short time, I am very grateful for your care. After Steve passed away, you were the only one who always spoke to me with warmth. I am the one who should be grateful, Emma, for your caregiving. I'll be living in a care facility from now on, so don't worry. All that's left is to wait for those two to receive their just desserts. Two weeks passed, and the day they returned from their trip came. While I was peacefully staying at my parents' house, my phone rang. My mother-in-law's name appeared on the screen. When I answered, she demanded I return home immediately, so I reluctantly agreed. Welcome back, mother. Did you enjoy your trip to Europe? Enjoyed it? That's not the point, Emma. We were happy to go on the trip you gifted us, but why are we being billed for it? There's a bill for $20,000. I thought it was lucky it only came to $20,000 for four of you. I was expecting it to easily exceed $30,000 with such luxurious accommodations. What are you talking about? Boyfriend? We just invited some friends from the neighborhood, and it was just the four of us. Oh. Is that so? But I have evidence here. Please have a look at the envelope on the living room table. My mother-in-law and Abby were then confronted with a report from a detective. What is this? You tricked us by hiring a detective, you sly woman. No, it wasn't me who hired the detective. It was my father-in-law. What dad did? Yes, it was actually my father-in-law who had requested the investigation. One day, he grew suspicious of my mother-in-law and Abby's behavior and installed a hidden microphone in the living room to eavesdrop on their conversations. Listen, mom. Last night, I went on a date with a charming man who earns over a million a year. He's married, but he showed a lot of interest in me and came on to me strongly. I ended up not coming home until morning. I'll make him divorce his wife and take him for myself. That's wonderful, Abby. Go ahead and get that man for yourself. I also hope my wealthy lover will divorce his spouse soon and become mine alone. Then, eventually, we'll leave this place and start a luxurious life. In fact, they were involved with married men and planning to leave my father-in-law behind and move out of the house. Furious with this revelation, my father-in-law and I planned the trip as a strategy. He expected them to bring their affairs along on the trip and hired a detective to investigate during their absence. The investigation revealed that the friends accompanying my M, other-in-law and Abby on the trip were, in fact, their extramarital lovers. Well, now that it's out, there's nothing else to do but to give up. I'm going to divorce your father and kick that man out of the house. And you, Emma, are no longer needed here. Really? How long do you plan to stay? Leave this house immediately. Leave, you worthless person living off the money Steve left behind. What? Can I really leave? Won't you regret this later? Of course. Don't make me repeat myself. Also, regarding the cost of the trip, you will be bearing it yourself. While I suggested the trip, I never mentioned it would be a gift. Humph, if it's about $20,000, I'll just have my wealthy lover pay for it. Is that so? Additionally, my father-in-law has already moved to a facility. Thank you for everything. Goodbye, and please do as you wish. Thus, I returned to my parents' home, feeling refreshed.
After spending some peaceful time at home, one day, my mother-in-law and Abby unexpectedly showed up at the entrance. Emma, we apologize for our behavior up to now. Please, come back, sister. I sincerely apologize for everything I've said and done. We really want you back. Oh, what brings both of you here? Why has it come to this? Our relationships outside were exposed, and the spouses are demanding a large compensation from us. I live on a pension, and Abby is in a regular employment with little savings. We don't know how to handle this. In fact, my father-in-law had sent the detective's report to the families of the lovers, resulting in a massive demand for compensation from them. Additionally, they were being sued for compensation for infidelity by my father-in-law as well. Moreover, we haven't settled the $20,000 for the trip yet. Could you possibly share Steve's inheritance with us? I categorically refuse. You treated me like a servant all this time. I cannot forgive you. Besides, the monthly living expenses of $5,000 were being paid out of my own savings, not from Steve's inheritance. What? You had that much in savings? I thought you worked in medical administration at a hospital. No, my daughter is a distinguished doctor at our hospital. My father, who is the director of a large hospital, appeared and informed them of the reality. Yes, I am his daughter and was working as a surgeon, recognized for my achievements and expected to succeed him as the director of the hospital. Steve and I were united by a romance that began at the same workplace. Recognizing the situation, my mother-in-law said, then, all the more reason we want you to come back, Emma, the future director of the hospital, please save us from our plight. We're going to suffer under debt. Please help us. Sister-in-law, they pleaded with tears. However, I firmly refused and securely locked the door. The commotion led to a neighbor calling the police and they were eventually taken away in a police car. Later, my mother-in-law and Abby were demanded to pay compensation by the spouses of their lovers. My mother-in-law also had to pay compensation to my father-in-law. They were also reminded to pay for the trip, resulting in significant debt. The scandal spread throughout the neighborhood, forcing them to move. They now live in a small apartment, juggling multiple jobs to pay off their debts. A deserved outcome. As for my father-in-law, his divorce was successfully finalized, and he enjoys a stress-free life in a care facility. As for me, I safely gave birth to a girl and am living a fulfilling life with the support of my parents. Next month, I plan to return to work, placing my daughter in daycare. I intend to carry on Steve's legacy, moving forward as both a doctor and a mother.